Good morning. Um, I don't think there's much doubt nowadays that coal, burning of coal has been a major part of increasing carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And therefore probably partly responsible for some of the climate change that Dave has just been talking about. I have to confess that I am probably part of the problem because my early stage of my career, I worked for the coal mining industry. I worked in Germany, the Saarbergwerk in Saarbrücken. But nowadays, I think maybe I rather more regard myself as a poacher turned gamekeeper because we were able to use some of the data that has been accumulated over the last couple of centuries to understand better how the climate, atmosphere and carbon interact in deep time. And that to an extent provides us with some insights, interesting insights, significant insights into what's happening today. Again, as Dave pointed out, coal has been an important uh, part of the community of uh, an economy of, of Northern England, but of course it, it's also for the entire area of Britain. We have coal, we have probably have more, a greater proportion of Britain is covered by coal deposits than most other European countries other than perhaps Belgium. Um, and you can see here, this is a, um, a map from the uh, coal board. Um, they extend from Scotland way down into Kent. And here, this is um, a map, you can see it. Uh, we, we attempted to draw the uh, wider European um, context with the British coal fields, then extending, these are all around about the same age, they're, about, they're in late Carboniferous age, about 300 million years old. And you have the, uh, the coal fields of Northern France, uh, the Ruhr, sorry, back. <sighs> Jumping ahead, <laughs> anyway. The area, of coal, the area of coal forests spread out about um, over about three quarters of a million square kilometers over Europe and formed a more or less coherent area during uh, the late Carboniferous time. One of the features of these sequences, in addition to the coals, is that they are, have abundant, um, they have abundant uh, um, plant fossils, particularly immediately above the coal seams. And it was recognized from early in the 19th century that these deposits were likely to have been formed in, um, in uh, dense forested conditions. And it is likely that the coal seams themselves were um, the remains of a peat that was built up in deep time. These, these are the sorts of fossils we regularly find in, in coal measure sequences, you know, barks of trees, ferny type leaves, whirls of leaves from horsetails. And so it was able to build up a, a a strong feeling of the morphology of the plants which were forming these peats. But then also in the 19th century, we started finding these things, uh, they're called coal balls, not calcitic nodules found in some of the coals. As you can imagine, miners hated these when they found them, hitting one of these with your pit, pick or shovel, yeah, an unpleasant surprise. But for paleobotanists, they have been a, a gold mine um, because if you section through them, you can find they are um, full of uh, plant remains and it confirms that these are these coal seams are actually peat. Uh, the nodules clearly formed early on before significant compaction occurred. And so you can see the details of the plants. And down here, you can see a couple of close ups. This is a cross section through a stem um, with a, a central vascular um, tissue surrounded by this area of corky tissue. And this is a section through a um, a fern pinnule, fern leaflet. You can see the um, the actual leaf, the leafy part of the pinnule there. Sorry, um, that's the that there is the mid vein, which would have been running up the centre of the of the leaflet. And to the left and the right of that, you can see the um, you can see the little sporangia. These ones are empty, but um, but sometimes you get the ferns. Um, you get the spores still preserved in them, so you can find out what spores were produced by these. Bringing all these data together, we've been able to get an understanding of how the, um, these swamps, these forests operated as a, as a biological structure, uh, not just what the plants look like, but um, the dist by looking at where the fossils occur relative to the sediment, we get some increasingly uh, good ideas as to how the ecology worked. Or these are reconstructions done by an artist that worked with us in Cardiff and at Townsend. Uh, and you can see there's um, where you've got areas where you get these these leafy poles called lycopsids growing. 
Um, the riverbanks where you got more like ferns growing, you got other areas where there were lake deposits where you get a lot of horsetails. So we are able to start putting together this entire ecosystem as a, as a, a living biological uh, concept, but from 300 million years ago. Great fun, very interesting, particularly useful when you're working and operating in coal mining areas because of the importance of coal to the general heritage the wider public interest in what produced their economic growth back in the 19th and early 20th centuries is still a very uh, a, a, a major uh, part of people's awareness of their um, their background. And talking about this is a is an excellent way of, of communicating with the public about the uh, the coal which their communities have been based. But now. We're also finding there's another story that these can tell us, not just about how the coal was formed, but it's actually helping us perhaps understand a little bit more about the world we live in today. If we look at the world of we think it was like in late Carboniferous times, this is a, a paleogeography map done by Torsvig and Cox a few years back. Um, you can see the where we think the um, the current um, land masses were. And if you plot on the area where the coals, coals are formed, you can see, sorry, every time I try and use the cursor, it goes to the next, it goes to the next. You can see where in green, they're occurring pretty well on the equator, certainly in tropical areas. And so it was in effect a tropical rainforest that we're looking at in terms of, the, um, in terms of these coal deposits. And then if you look further south, um, down into what is now South America, South Africa, um, we see evidence of glacial deposits. There was clearly an extensive ice cap at the time. And you might say, well, okay, so this is fine. It's what's so different about any other time. Surely we've also always had uh, polar ice. We've always had tropical rainforests. Well, in fact, no. The only other times when we've had this combination really has been in late Carboniferous and immediately afterwards early Permian times. If you look at most of the time of the Mesozoic, um, I, when I talk to the kids, I say, you remember when all the dinosaurs were tromping around? There was no or very little polar ice. There was no really significant difference in the vegetation between low, middle and high latitudes. So this is quite an unusual combination of um, uh, uh, situations. And so if you want to find a model for understanding today, really that the late Carboniferous um, and early Permian is the best one we have, although it's 300 million years ago. One of the things we therefore decided to do when everybody was becoming concerned about today's global warming was, can we look at how the coal forests were distributed and how that changed through time? Uh, a paper I did with my old chum, Barry Thomas from Aberystwyth was we took a series of paleogeographical maps. Uh, these were, this was done back in the early two, 2000s and they were by Chris Catizzi. Uh, they were the best of maps available at the time. And you can see, you know, try and not... The top left-hand corner is the earliest one and then they go become progressively younger going down and then into the right-hand column. We did a series of about 10 maps representing different um, uh, time periods and plotted on where we thought the coal, the coal swamps were growing. This is partly on the distribution of the coal deposits as they are today, but also we try to extrapolate and fill in the gaps because some areas the coal deposits have been removed by erosion or the coal deposits are covered nowadays by um, much younger rocks and so uh, cannot be accessed. So. In these innocent days before we had computers, we did have computers, but nothing like the fancy um, packages we can use today. And um, we basically drew on the maps where we thought they occurred and measured the area and compared the area of coal forest going through the um, geological time. And it resulted in this graph, um, time going from bottom up to the top, progressively younger, and the thickness of the um, the thickness of the um, of the, of the graph is basically the um, area we think was covered by coal forests, and it resulted in this bimodal this bimodal um, graph with a peak down in in the in the late Carboniferous, 
and the, it was mainly the European and American coal fields. They then underwent a very sharp decline at the end of what's called Moscovian times. But at that time, slowly, similar forests started to build up in China. And the result, when you combine the two areas, you get this bimodal, this double peaked graph. And when you compare that with what we knew, at the, uh, we still know of the wider um, climate. On the left, you get uh, evidence. This is mainly from um, Argentina, which was the main available data when we did the paper. Australia has produced some very similar results now, and it's um, verifying this. A series of glacials and interglacials, but in particular, a very sharp, long lasting interglacial in the late Carboniferous. And on the right, you can see evidence. This was based on work in Siberia by Serge Mayen and Marina Durante, two of the leading um, Soviet paleobotanists at the time. And they also seem to suggest that there was a period of definite cooling during the very late Carboniferous, the Alakaeval climate optimum, uh, and then cooling returned as you get into the Permian. Of course, when you compare them, there seems to be a, a good correlation between the time when the coal forests, when the, these tropical rainforests went into decline and a distinct era of, um, of warming, global warming, and a long lasting um, interglacial, particularly in the Gondwana times. We clearly need to therefore to find out a bit more about what was happening with the forests, not just what their distribution was, we could work that out relatively straightforward, but what was happening in terms of the ecology and the, um, and the, um, and the biology of the plants. I, I haven't got time to go into in, in detail, but I coordinated it during the 2000s and early 2010s, uh, a series of um, collaborative projects funded through UNESCO, where we brought colleagues together from across Europe and Eastern North America to try and look at changes in the species diversity. These graphs have, spread, uh, have been attempts to show how the number of the species that were present at any one time in these swamps changed as you went through um, through time. Um, you can see there was quite significant differences between coal fields and it was clearly being controlled partly by um, partly by uh, local factors, uh, particularly landscape changes. There were some similarities. You can see there was a, there was a distinct peak. Yeah. Um, I, um, in the Middle Duck Mountain, which you pick up in the Central Pennines and the Southern Pennines and in South Wales, but the other changes are quite different. We're trying to now work out use these data to try and work out what was happening in terms of the vegetation as a dynamic changing um, um, a changing um, ecosystem and see if we can work out from this what was causing the changes and whether that can uh, help us understand what was happening. The, this is a fairly generalized um, summary of what we concluded from the these UNESCO projects. Uh, it's a, basically showing with a vertical axis representing time. Um, the horizontal is, is the from east to west. So on the, on to the right, you've got the uh, coal fields in Bulgaria. Uh, and also would include Zongzak in Turkey, which is the far east as we can go. And then going further, um, going further west through Silesia, the British Isles, Canadian Maritimes, and eventually into the American uh, coal fields. And the, overall, this is a, a fairly consistent pattern. There's a change from the forests which are dominated by the club mosses, the lycophytes. They were progressively replaced by ferns and eventually by, uh, by conifers. But it occurred at different times at different places and it seems to have started in the far east, uh, in the far east of Europe and became, became progressively younger as you um, uh, went, um, went west. And there seems to be some correlation between that and the uh, level of the, the little wiggly lines are meant to be the, um, the tectonic, the landscape disturbance, which was occurring at the time. So why was this important? Well, the change from a club moss uh, to a, a fern to eventually a conifer type of vegetation had significant um, effects on the carbon cycle at the time. Why? Well, it's mainly because of these club mosses on the left. They weren't, they were the size of trees. They could be anything up to 30, 35 meters tall. 
they were nothing like trees in the way they grew. Um, they grew very fast, mainly because their trunks were um, not made of wood. They were almost like mostly made of a corky tissue. They could grow to their full height, we believe, in about 30 years, 25, 30 years. But they also had a growth pattern, which we call determinate growth. And that is more like what we call an annual plant. These weren't annuals, they were 20 years, 25 year cycles, but they would grow to their full size, they would reproduce and they would die. You compare that with a, a modern day tree, whether it's a, a, a nice, I think this is supposed to be a beech tree or a, a, a tropical rainforest tree even, which would grow to their full mature size and then sit there for decades, if not centuries. And so the carbon cycle was completely different. These club mosses were sucking carbon out of the atmosphere and then dying and then that carbon was being buried and sequestrated underground. We did some general uh, calculations back at the envelope a little more to be honest but they I think they still hold that if you look at a, a modern day forest they will see even in a tropical environment it will sequestrate something in a region of about six, six tons of carbon per hectare per annum. Whereas these club mosses could be doing anything up to 250, maybe 300 or more tons per hectare per annum. And as you can imagine, this was having a phenomenal effect on the carbon cycle. And therefore, you, if you get rid of the, if you lose the club mosses in your, in your, in your forests and the forests are declining also, clearly this is going to be having a dramatic impact on the, on the carbon budget and the amount of carbon which is uh, within the atmosphere. So um, what have we learned? Well, we've, certainly we've learned that there's a clear correlation between the climate and the extent and the composition of the, um, the coal swamps 300 million years ago. We know that the swamps underwent this significant contraction and change in the dominant trees about 307 million years ago. This is the end of what we call the Moscovian age. Um, at the time, we think we, the swamps, this change in the swamps may be equivalent to two to five parts per million per annum change increase in the carbon dioxide, carbon dioxide which wasn't being sucked out of the atmosphere when, they were, when these trees were growing at their full extent. And interesting, that's very similar to the amount of carbon dioxide which is increasing today due to fuel emissions. So we can't say this tells us about how important it is to preserve tropical rainforests today, because today's tropical rainforests are biologically quite different. But it does tell you, I think, that the, if you change um, the carbon budget to the level we are day, doing today, that in the past, it does seem to correlate with this smart period of global warming. Of course, still the question remains, did the contraction or the change of the swamps cause the global warming? Or as some people have argued that the climate change caused the contraction of the swamps. We're still working on this. I think, in fact, it was the swamps contraction that affected the climate, but that is a, frankly a diff another lecture and a, diff a different story. Just to wind up on, um, when I was asked to give this talk, I was asked to focus on Northern England, or the Northeastern England coal fields, which is rather unfortunate because I've never worked in the Northern, Northeast of England. And in fact, there's been relatively little work done on the fossil plants of northeastern England, with the one major uh, exception of this chap here, William Hutton, who was a, 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 a geologist working in the early part of the um, 19th century, uh, rapidly um, built up a massive collection, a very important collection of plant fossils from the uh, Newcastle and uh, Durham coal fields. Uh, the collection is now in the, um, in the Great Northern Museum in Newcastle. It is one of Britain's most important collections of plant fossils of this age. In fact, it's been hardly ever studied. One of the great disappointments of not coming up to this conference was that I was going to intend to go afterwards to go over to Newcastle to go to the collections, which um, is still something I've got to promise myself. These, these fossils are remarkably well preserved. And as I say, but hardly anybody, I don't I have no reason for this, hardly anybody since Hutton has actually worked on these. Um, the only one I have worked on a few years ago was this thing called Eremopterus. It's a very unusual species. It doesn't occur really in many places. And for reasons I have no explanation for, the Northern England has got the best collections. Um, and 
we decided to talk, we didn't really know what the affinities of this plant was, so we thought we'd, we'd um, focus on it. Jason Hilton from Birmingham, my friend um, Cedric Shute from the Natural History Museum, and I uh, went to town on this. We borrowed a lot of the specimens from the from what was then the Hancock. And um, these are, I think, these are both Hancock specimens. Um, one of the th they look like a bit like ferns, but in fact they're not ferns. Regularly, you get these small horn seeds. Now I'm going to try and pick one up. You can see them. Ah, you see them there, associated with the leaves. The thing with these fossils is they're beautifully preserved in that you get the cuticles. These are cuticles we prepared as part of the study. On the left, top of left, you can see part of the leaf, and the, the holes, which are the breathing pores, the stomata, the papillae. On the right, it's from the rachis with these, uh, with these scars. And at the bottom, we have the seeds. Now, one of these seeds, this is Cedric's um, great contribution. He photographed one of the seeds on the left, as it appears on the rock, then macerated it out. And on the right, you get the, um, all the seed um, membranes still preserved. And you can see details of the, the um, of the seed, particularly in the upper part and the pollen chamber, which is um, given us much greater insights into the into the affinities of these plants. Okay, I think I think we're going to have to wrap it up there, yep, Chris. Yeah, that's it. I, that was the end. I was just saying this is the coal swamps. They have a role to play, both I think in terms of understanding climate today, but also in terms of the general understanding of coal mm -hmm. and its mm -hmm. importance to us. Thank you. Okay, well, thanks very much, Chris. That was a, a really comprehensive look at the uh, the Carboniferous and a lot of what you were saying, as, as, as you pointed out, is of much relevance for, for the, uh, the current discussions on climate change. So thank you.